Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about culture uh, and international relations. Um, so I was, I'm gonna start with a recent panel uh, that I was at uh, on the past, present and potential future Cold Wars. Uh, and at that panel, one of my co-panelists declared that the fall of the Berlin Wall was primarily a local event, not an international or global history. And my initial reaction was to forcefully disagree. And of course, uh, disagree I did, conjuring up all sorts of very important arguments that I now cannot quite recall. Uh, but I assume that many here um, in the audience might well uh, have agreed with me. But the comment stayed with me long after the event. And I began to wonder if my colleague might in fact have a point. What did it matter to the citizens of South Africa, whether East and West Germans could visit each other for coffee and kuchen? What difference did it make in the Indian Pakistani border disputes to the people in Iran? How did it change the Arab Israeli conflict? Um, not much. And something else occurred to me as well. Local did not necessarily mean unimportant or of no consequence for larger geopolitical transformations. Uh, in fact, I had to say that I myself have actually been arguing something similar yet have drawn different conclusions. Um, so in my own research, I've explored the local dimensions of the Cold War. I have moved beyond the geopolitical conflicts that have dominated the traditional narrative of the Cold War. We all know them, the battles over Berlin, the Korean War, the Vietnam Wars, the Cuban Missile Crisis, detente, Reagan Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, instead, I focused on people and processes that occurred outside the realm of high power politics on cultural contexts in which the Cold War unfolded and on the way in which people outside the halls of government acted as transnational conduits across the Cold War divide. This is by all accounts local history. Um, and I've done so in my various publications that Fabian already mentioned, both looking at informal relationships that developed between American soldiers and German civilians in the immediate post-war period um, uh, many of them young women who became romantically involved with American GIs. Um, in the politics of peace, I wrote about scientists, clergy, women, leftist activists who populated the transnational peace movements of the 1950s and 1960s. And um, I'm gonna put in a little plug for the forthcoming book in this book that I just completed with my colleague Akira Iria. Uh, we have expanded on these local and cultural themes. Uh, local, in other words, does not need to imply unimportant or without a broader impact. What is important to recognize in my view is that even though events might've been local, or the connections intimate and personal, they still had broader consequences. Consequences for the political relationship between states and consequences within the global arena. And that is what I wanna uh, explore uh, with you or wanna talk about today. Um, to put it simply, I wanna ask the question of how our understanding of historical events changes when we examine them through a cultural lens. And I've chosen the Cold War as a case study here because it has been studied so exhaustively as a geopolitical event, because it demarcates a clearly defined historical period, and because its cultural facets are so varied and so rich. So the more specific question I want to tackle is twofold. One, what significance do cultural elements have in the historical narration of the Cold War? And two, how does our understanding of the Cold War as a whole change when we apply a cultural approach? So for the remainder of the talk, I will take you um, on a tour of seven. In fact, I will tell you later it's five, but, but for now I'll stick to seven. Uh, five ways of viewing the Cold War through a cultural lens. Um, I should also mention that none of this is new to those of you who have kept abreast of Cold War historiography over the last two or three decades. 
But it is also true that little of this tremendous bond of knowledge has actually made it into the kinds of popular Cold War histories that most Americans and Germans read. So I've ch chosen seven arenas which not only showcase the cultural dimension of the Cold War, but also alter the way we interpret the Cold War as a historical era. So they're the following. Um, there are atomic cultures, gendered Cold Wars, racial Cold Wars, youth cultures, human rights, consumer cultures, and religion. And because my time is limited, I only have, I wanna be done in, in 30 minutes roundabout, I will not get to all seven. Um, uh, when I sent in the title, I was rather too ambitious. And once I started writing, I realized this was not gonna be possible. So I am actually cutting out religion and cutting out consumer cultures, but I'm happy to talk about both of these in the Q&A if you're interested. And I also have to say that, of course, there are other dimensions that deserve mention as well. For instance, environmental concerns, which I'm only partially addressing within the atomic culture section. Um, but because I'm already a quarter into my allotted time, let me just get going on at least these five points. So um, atomic cultures first. Cold War historians have spent a good deal of effort dissecting the role of nuclear weapons in shaping the Cold War. Some have credited the policy of deterrence for avoiding nuclear war. Others have blamed Truman's fateful decision not to share the secret of the making of the first bombs with American wartime allies or placing atomic weapons under international control for creating the Cold War in the first place. Cold War historians discuss um, Eisenhower's apparent willingness to use nuclear weapons as part of his new look policy, uh, Kennedy's test ban treaty in 1963. They cover the negotiations regarding the first comprehensive arms control agreement, SALT I, in the early 1970s. SALT II is a frequent uh, topic of uh, scholarly works, uh, one that of course was never ratified because, the Soviet, because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in late 1979. Um, they discuss any number of the series of strategic arms reductions treaties signed after the end of the Cold War. Uh, issues like nuclear intelligence, the drama of atomic spies in the 1950s, and there I realized it is rather curious that there was either no longer a drama or no more spies in later decades, because we talk a lot about the Rosenbergs, but nothing that seems to have transpired in later decades. They discuss scientific technicality, technicalities, um, the comparative strength of various new inventions. Uh, in short, the narrative of the nuclear Cold War is filled with national security documents, symmetry, high-level diplomacy and spies, of course. So how does a cultural dimension alter that narrative? How does it change our perspective on the Cold War? First of all, it reorients our gaze away from the subject of high-level diplomacy to how atomic war is being imagined. It also focuses on cultures of fear fear of atomic war. Um, it focuses um, on Soviet and um, it, it's, it focuses on the Soviet and European uh, cultures that dealt with the anxiety about nuclear war, things like fallout shelters. So when we drill down to the root of the threat, we're also faced with the contradictions that are impossible to resolve within the realm of rationality. Nuclear weapons were seen as both the greatest threat to security, um, if they belong to the other side, and the best source of security, those that belong to us. Both the US and the Soviet, unions got them, Soviet Union got themselves stuck in what Americans call a catch-22. Um, and that meant that in order to prevent nuclear war, one had to convince the other side of the willingness to wage nuclear war. 
the idea of mutually assured destruction was built on such an absurd foundation. The acceptance of complete annihilation is the only way to prevent such an annihilation. There are other cultural aspects of the nuclear theme, including how daily lives became dominated by nuclear fear. For instance, through civil defense measures, through fallout shelters, uh, through reorienting educational priorities. The United States built a whole highway system, arguing that it was for uh, the event of a nuclear uh, attack and how the threat of nuclear war inspired peace, anti-nuclear, and ultimately environmental movements. These cultural dimensions of the nuclear threat transform our understanding of the Cold War. They shift the analysis from the quantitative theoretical levels, such as zero-sum game theory, comparative threat assessments, to the human level. They show how much of Cold War nuclear decision-making was actually grounded in fear and how little was grounded in hard facts, knowable truths, and real political assessments. And it opens the perspective to the multiple challenges to the Cold War paradigm, um, challenges that undermined the idea of a Cold War consensus that existed at the state level. So let me turn to the role of gender in the Cold War. Before the advent of the cultural turn, not a single volume, lecture, or article on the Cold War addressed the issue of gender. Though once people started looking, they noticed it everywhere. There are two dimensions to the use of gender within historical analysis. One is to examine the role of women. Um, their role in shaping historical transformations as well as the effect of historical transformations on them. So we have historians like Elaine Tyler May, Liz Cohen, Melanie Illich, and Helen Laville, um, and others who have documented the ways in which women's lives were affected by the Cold War and how women in turn engaged and altered the national and international discourse around Cold War threats um, how they engaged in peace overtures, uh, how they shaped home life and education. So to take one example, Elaine Tyler May wrote about the idea of the nuclear family as a protective cocoon against the outside threats of nuclear war and communist subversion. Women were expected to contribute to civil defense by preparing their homes for a potential nuclear attack. You can see here uh, in the image, um, the perfect um, outfitting of a, um, of a middle-class homeless uh, shelter with lots of canned goods, uh, games, and, and if, I don't know whether you can see um, what the, the dad in the picture is holding either a shovel, but there's also guns involved to protect against outside intruders. Um, in short, national and domestic security became inextricably intertwined. One other example is the famous kitchen debate between Vice President Richard Nixon and the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. They're seen here um, at the American exhibition in Moscow in 1959. And they stopped at this particular exhibit of a model American kitchen. Um, and you see on the right there a washing machine and Nixon pointed to all the new amenities uh, in the kitchen that made women's domestic chores so much easier, for instance, the washing machine. And Khrushchev countered that Russian women were out in the world working for a living and not cooped up and hidden away in the home. Um, this kind of contrast um, was uh, illustrated um, also in this image um, of the Polish uh, artist Wojciech Fangor. It's called Pustacy. Um, and it pictures on the right the good, um, virtuous um, socialist couple. You see the woman in work clothes, 
Um, and on the left, if you can tell the, the woman, of course, with painted fingernails, painted lips, um, but also her dress is filled with certain brand names, including Coca-Cola and others. So the image that was conjured up here uh, was that communist socialist women were producers, Western women were uh, consumers. Um, of course, women also played different uh, roles in the Cold War. This is, of course, a cliche that, that the Soviets, but also Western uh, women played up or Western, Western media played up. But of course, we also know that women played a crucial role in uh, challenging the Cold War par paradigms in um, peace movements of the 1950s and 60s. Um, they contributed to challenging the Cold War consensus uh, and forging informal cultural contexts across the Cold War um, divide. Something that can only become visible once historians look beyond high power politics. The other dimension uh, of the gender approach is reflected in the use of gender as uh, an analytical category, uh, as a historical category of analysis. Um, and here, the work of Joan Scott is really crucial, uh, has been very crucial to foreign relations historian. Um, her article, Gender a Useful Category of Analysis, which was published in 1986, um, opened opportunities for gender research in international relations history. She demonstrated how gender served to signify relations of power, uh, opening up a whole new way of analyzing the Cold War. Um, and historians have followed up with that. For instance, uh, Robert Dean has shown how an obsession with appearing tough guided many of the discussions uh, and decisions within the Kennedy White House when it came to dealing with international crisis, particularly the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis. On the flip side uh, was the obsessive concern with alleged homosexuals in the State Department as documented in detail by historian David K. Johnson's The Lavender Scare. So his work aptly demonstrates the intersections um, um, between the intersection between gender troubles and national security concerns. We have other works in the international arena foreign where foreign countries were seen and treated in gendered terms and gendered language was used to legitimize and justify power inequalities between nations. Uh, we also wanna point out briefly this anthology by Philip Muhlenbeck about gender, sexuality and the Cold War. Um, um, that also contributed, uses this uh, analytical tool. Of course, this was not a phenomenon unique to the Cold War. Um, uh, gender had shaped foreign relations debates before the Cold War and continues to shape politics and international relations to the present. Um, I venture that historians of gender will have a field day uh, very soon analyzing Trump's foreign policy uh, and the recent incident involving the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, European Union Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen, European Council President Charles Michel, and a missing chair speaks volumes about the centrality of gender in foreign relations. Um, but before I digress, I could, I could go on about this. Um, let me actually move on to the third point, uh, and that is racial Cold War. Considerations of race was not at all part of Cold War history either prior to the onset of the cultural turn. The impetus here, as in other arenas, came from outside diplomatic history, initially from US civil rights historians who noted the uh, global dimensions of the civil rights movement, um, who noted the parallels who's, uh, that that civil rights activists drew between their domestic struggle for equal rights in the United States and the anti-colonial struggles in Africa and Asia for national independence. African-Americans closely followed the decolonization wave that swept Africa in the late 50s and 1960s. Um, in turn, um, 
that those movements changed the course and rhetoric of the civil rights movement in the United States. It did help give rise to the Black Power Movement of the mid 1960s. And it introduced an anti-colonial vocabulary that differed markedly from the earlier integrationist arguments. Um, black power activists and civil rights activists uh, started using language, uh, the language of struggle, of liberation, self-determination, and nationalism. Um, you might right now ask the question, what does all this have to do with the Cold War? And you are uh, right to ask, because in many ways, decolonization was a process that unfolded outside the purview of the Cold War. But once we look closer, we see the Cold War looming over every instance of national liberation. Both sides wooed the newly independent countries and vilified the other side. The Soviets, of course, pointed to the racial inequality stubbornly persisting in the United States, particularly in the American South, and labeled the Western meddling in the post-colonial states as an instance of neo-imperialism. The Americans, on the other hand, warned countries seeking uh, uh, independence that the Soviet Union would fall, short, would fall short of its promise of economic prosperity, freedom, and equality. It has, of course, long been established by historians that by the mid to late 1950s, Americans and Russians waged the Cold War increasingly in the Third World. And it is also long established that the Third World tried very hard to stay above the fray, most prominently at the 1955 Bandung Conference. Um, um, an image of it you see here, where Asian and African countries, some not yet independent, pledged non-alignment. And of course, there was the war in Vietnam, where colonialism and national liberation converged with race in a prolonged and bloody conflict. Vietnam could not be explained by looking only at geopolitical or even economic factors. There were a host of underlying cultural and racial assumptions that led first France to reclaim Vietnam or Indochina as its colony after World War II, and then the United States to involve itself, itself ever deeper on the false assumption that it could win the war both against and for the Vietnamese people. Race was crucial to the war at all levels, the small tactical and strategic military decisions no less than the big geopolitical decisions to continue the war despite clear evidence that it could not be won. Let me turn to youth cultures. Um, youth culture as a way of seeing the Cold War might also at first sight seem far-fetched. But youth, I argue, became the most persistent agents of change in the Cold War and ultimately in the way it was conducted. And I'm talking about several generations of youth who challenged again and again the Cold War consensus, each in their own way. The image you see here is actually one that shows the Russian uh, group Stilagi, style hunters in 1950s uh, Russia. Um, there were groups modeling themselves, youth groups modeling themselves on American culture all over Eastern Europe. This is an image here of the German Halbstarke, which many of you uh, Germans probably know quite well. Uh, there were the Bikinarzi in Poland. Uh, they took their name from the atomic test site of the Americans in the South Pacific. There were the Pazek in, the, in Czechoslovakia, the Jumpek in Hungary. Uh, there were the Teds uh, in Great Britain. All of these groups challenged strict cultural, social, and gender norms of the early post-war period norms that were imposed by a Cold War uh, um, security culture. The first group to challenge um, this Cold War consensus um, in the cultural realm were the beatniks. Um, and here's a, an image 
of uh, five of them, and I could only identify four of them. They were Ellen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, and Ken Casey. Um, they um, incorporated sort of the intellectual far left tradition that challenged American, American uh, cultural uh, conformity. Um, another group uh, emerged rebellious were, um, took their cues from working class traditions. Um, uh, and they were very much inspired uh, or maybe, uh, maybe these youth inspired the making of the movie, The Wild One and Marlon Brando's character in this movie actually became the uh, icon of this working class youth culture. Um, and those of you who've seen images of the German Hauptstadt see um, how the dress was really uh, very similar, the leather jacket. If you have not seen The Wild One yet, it, it's, it, I would recommend it. It's a really interesting movie and it is actually based on a real event that occurred in the late 1940s in a small California town in the town of Hollister where for about, I think, as many as two days, a, a group, uh, several groups of motorcycle gangs terrorized a small town. The Cold War connection of these various youth movements was both contextual as well as causal. Um, the 1950s saw the first stirrings of rebellion by young people against the social and cultural constraints imposed by the Cold War uh, social system. The system required conformity. It frowned on those with a different lifestyle, different sexual orientation, different ways of dressing, uh, all in the name of national security. Censorship, surveillance, conformity were the hallmarks of not just Eastern European societies, but Western ones as well. And it crossed the East-West divide with a strong influence of American youth culture on young people in the Soviet bloc, as I pointed out with these different groups earlier. What's interesting is that the Soviet Union attempted to co-opt some of that youthful spirit by staging a World Youth Festival in 1957 in Moscow. Um, and that youth festival for the first time in the Cold War brought together Eastern and Western youth in a multi-day festival that featured street performances, open air jazz, folk music concerts, and the likes. It also included some political rallies, but the atmosphere was remarkably loose and remarkably infused with um, music that youth in both Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the US actually liked. The youth who attended the festival, even the few Western participants, largely enjoyed the opportunity for direct exchange across the Cold War divide. But whether this event did more to endear communist youth to Western culture than endear Western youth to the communist way of life was not quite uh, clear. The next wave of youth activism became more political. Um, and that was the 1960s protest movements that emerged out of the civil rights movement in the United States and spread to Europe, Latin America, and Asia. These movements um, uh, featured uh, important themes, um, not just civil rights, e uh, racial equality, but also eliminating nuclear weapons, overcoming the Cold War divide, and of course, challenging the Vietnam War. The pressure from below generated by these movements significantly contributed to the political shift toward a policy of detente, something that has not been articulated um, um, in most policy-oriented Cold War histories. And of course, then we have a new wave of protests in the 1980s with new anti-nuclear uh, demonstrations that opposed the stationing of medium range nuclear weapons in Western Europe and called for the abolition of nuclear weapons altogether. This was in reaction to the NATO double track decision um, um, in, in, the, in the early 1980s. Uh, and then finally, we have, of course, the protests in the late 1980s in Eastern Europe that ultimately brought down the socialist regimes there. 
they were also primarily, though not exclusively, driven by young people. Um, the overall point I want to make here is that young people have consistently challenged con conventional wisdom about how the world is ordered and how and who should hold power. They have frequently pushed for the transformation of social, cultural, and political orders. Um, and so it was with the Cold War mindset as well, ultimately um, leading to uh, some form of success in 1989. Lastly, let me turn to human rights, uh, an issue that might well be the most important one. Um, the subject of human rights in many ways takes us outside the framework of the Cold War. And that is an important point to make. It points both to the extent and the limits of the Cold War frame of reference. Human rights concerns obviously preceded the Cold War and continued on after the end of the Cold War. And so we have to ask the question, did the Cold War change the way people thought about, violated, or fought for human rights? And our answer has to be mixed. Human rights rhetoric was certainly pressed into service by both sides in the Cold War. The Soviets blamed Americans for human rights violations in its treatment of African Americans, something many African Americans agreed with. For instance, W. E. Du Bois uh, was one of the first to bring a human rights case before the United Nations in the late 1940s at a point when uh, the UN was had just um, uh, completed and ratified its Declaration of Human Rights. He accused the United States of violating the Black population's human rights. In the 1960s and 70s, international human rights activists accused the American government of violating human rights in Vietnam. Uh, it um, um, accused the US of supporting brutal dictatorships in Latin America. There was a movement that called for Henry Kissinger being labeled, being, being called a war criminal. Um, the Americans um, had their own um, human rights accusations that they hurled against the Soviets, um, including uh, its censorship of the free press, political repression, imprisoning uh, political dissidents, its surveillance system, um, and ultimately also the denial of the free movement of people. But human rights as a global cause obviously transcended the Cold War, particularly as non-governmental organizations focused increasing attention on protecting individuals from human rights violations within the domestic, within domestic frameworks. For instance, Amnesty International um, took up cases of individual prisoners and tried very hard to create uh, public awareness of their fate. The organization tried to be neutral in the Cold War and it did so by asking local branches to take up one case each from the first, the second, and the third world in creating almost an illusion of equivalency that human rights violations uh, were occurring equally in all parts of the world. Later in the 1970s, as human rights became an integral part of high power diplomacy, agreements such as the Helsinki Accords empowered grassroots movements in Eastern Europe to challenge state authority and ultimately contributed to the end of the Cold War. This is an argument made by Sarah Snyder in her book. Leading Eastern European dissidents, such as the Russian scientist Andrei Sakharov or the Czech playwright Václav Havel, were key drivers of the human rights. Uh, cause in their respective countries and within a transnational activist uh, community. But despite the progress and engagement of a transnational community of activists, human rights violations continued unabated after the end of the Cold War and a global consensus about how to better prevent, police, or punish human rights violations remains elusive to this day. Future historians might uh, well abandon the idea of the Cold War as the main uh, event of the second half of the 
20th century and see it instead as part of a bigger story of the struggle for human rights and global justice that characterized this period. So let me conclude here. I have probably now given you way too many ways of retelling the Cold War than you can process within the span of a single lecture. For that, I apologize. But I wanted to give you a glimpse of the very dynamic, of a very dynamic field of historical reinterpretation 30 years after the end of the actual Cold War. I want to leave you with one overarching final thought. And that is that by looking at all these different facets, we are actually beginning the process of writing our way out of the Cold War as a geopolitical event in world history. While 20 years ago, this was still the dominant story in international relations of the second half of the 20th century. But today, the Cold War no longer is the only story to tell. In other words, we are beginning to put the Cold War in broader perspective. And I would even go so far as to say that we should begin rewriting the Cold War as an imagined war rather than a real or real political one. Cultural analysis has helped us identify the imaginary in this era and separate it from the real. That does not mean, and I want to stress this, it does not mean that the Cold War was not real or not an important historical phenomenon, but historians are increasingly telling it as a story embedded within other stories, such as human rights, social justice, social justice political dissidents, or cultural, cultural history. And that is a good thing. It is a sign that the field is maturing that it is beginning to pay attention to what is going on at its margins and in neighboring historiographical fields. And it enables us to integrate Cold War international history with other fields of historical inquiry. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.